Good evening, welcome to the Adventures Club of Los Angeles. My name is Rich Mayfield, member 1211. I'm your first VP and programs chairman for the year. Um, we are broadcasting live. This is what we do now, uh, telling stories of adventure every Thursday night. Um, broadcast to YouTube, that's where you're watching us. So don't forget to like this video if you do like it, I guess, and subscribe to our channel. That helps us out. Tonight, I'm here with Leon Schoenfeld, and Leon did an expedition to Cambodia, right? That's right. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, we do appreciate you coming in, you know. Um, I know I know it's tough to, to get places and do things these days, but appreciate you. You're, you live in Santa Barbara, right? I do. Um, and I think we've all been through worse getting to places, so yeah. it's always nice to come down to L.A. Yeah, so LA, L.A. is easy compared to what we're going to talk about tonight, right? Very true. So you went to Cambodia, mm -hmm. and you went to the Mekong River. Can That's you, right. You, and it was an expedition, right? Yeah, so it was a scientific expedition sponsored both by the Adventurers Club, the Explorers Club, Rolex, and the uh, Cambodian Ministry of Agriculture. Wow, you, got, you had some heavy-hitting sponsors behind that trip. Yeah, I think, I think I mean, we... the Adventurers Club. <laughs> <laughs> and the Explorers Club. Yes, it was, it's definitely a privilege to be able to be encouraged to go out into the world, do science and adventure at the same time. So how did you get hooked up with this particular expedition? So I got hooked up through a friend, Alex Shumate, who is the president of the Adventurers Club. And he put me in contact with Garrett Cooper, who is the leader of an organization called Feral Expeditions. Feral Expeditions. And they are focused on bringing people into places where you would normally not go, kind of a little bit on the rougher side of life. And in this case, he was very um, generous to bring a, a larger continuum of scientific expertise on his trip to fulfill our mission of what we needed to do there. So this was a scientific expedition and it had some spe specific objectives. Yes. So what were, what were the objectives of this particular expedition? So we had several objectives all ranging from different members. So for myself and another member, Rebecca Ziegler, we were the water technicians on this trip. We were doing work for the Agricultural Society and the Ministry of Cambodia, and we were doing water sampling. So we were checking all the different, most important aspects of your water quality in the Mekong River, mainly for microplastics, temperature, different aspects of turbidity. So we were really checking to see how the water quality of the Mekong was. Okay. And we also had a documentary that was being done. By so you got, you got brought on this because you're, you're, you're a scientist. Yes. What do, you, what do you do in your day job? So in my day job, unfortunately, it's not scientific pursuant, but I run a small writing company in Santa Barbara called The Writing Foundry. Okay. But my background is in scientific aspects, in environmental science, and water and sustainability was a big focus of that. So they wanted somebody else on the trip that had expertise, and I love adventure, and I said, sign me up. And you knew Alec. And I knew Alec, connected. and it's, you know, all he had to say was adventure, and I was, I was, on, I was on board. <laughs> You're on board I was, with it. I was ready to go. Before you said yes, did you know where you were going? Not really. You knew I mean, you were like, going to Southeast yeah, Asia? Yeah, we were never going to Southeast Asia. We know we were going to go to Cambodia, but the actual scope and severity of the trip was kind of not sure yet. I think nobody really knew what we were going to get ourselves into, but it was definitely something we are like, yeah adventure, let's go. We'll see what's going to be. So why, why did you want to go on the trip? Uh, it's, it's definitely a dual aspect. One, I think the scientific work that is being done there is extremely important. Microplastics and plastics are expanding all around the world, especially in that area. And then another thing is, is the personal achievement. I think being able to push yourself and push yourself out of your comfort zone to do something different is something that I value. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I wanted to do. That's a pretty good reason. Most, yes. b most of the time, we were talking earlier, most of the time at the Adventurers Club, we just go do something because, you know, it's there. Like, I never have an answer for anything. Yeah. Why did you climb <laughs> that mountain? I don't know. It was there. And we never, at the Adventurers Club, we never talk about why. But, you know, you, you had that, I think you articulated it well, you know, both the personal growth aspect and the ability to do some serious scientific research, right? Absolutely. That is sweet talking a little bit because I am very much in your field where, it's there. It is something to do, something different than what you normally have in your daily life, and it's definitely worth it. So you would have done this, sorry about that, you would have done this regardless of whether or not... Yes, absolutely. Yeah, there was the, a scientific the, the scientific reason. aspect is something that I always appreciate. Yeah. But, uh, but that's a great opportunity to be able to get both, right? To be yes. able to do both things. Yes, absolutely. So um, 
you mentioned so so you mentioned there were some other people on the trip, some other um, scientists or people doing research. What mm -hmm. were the other what were the other aspects? So we had Lee Wright. She was doing. She's a documentarian, and she is studying specifically in East Asia the aspects of changing culture and the impact of China in the area. Mm -hmm. So China has been expanding all around the world in their own ways. You know, the African continent is one, all their close neighbors of Cambodia, Taiwan. And we saw and talked to the locals about how they actually felt and how they were impacted by that nation kind of coming in and in certain ways really running things. You know, even just through going through the actual nation, you see signs of Chinese involvement everywhere. You see China-Cambodia China Friendship Bridge, China, Cambodia, you know, international school. And we, right when we were there doing our water studies, we started our trip on one of the largest dam hydroelectric projects mm -hmm. in Cambodia, right on the border of Vietnam. So right on the border of Cambodia and Vietnam, I guess, I guess China doesn't have an agreement with Vietnam. Yeah, no. Because <laughs> as soon as the Mekong gets into um, Cambodia, they put a dam on it, huh? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, literally, like, right behind the dam is where that border started. So. You can wonder how they feel about that. Yeah, I'd say. Well, because that, that would back up the that would back up all the waters yeah. into the Vietnam side, right? And, and I doubt that that's a shared plan, but I don't know enough to speak on that. Interesting. Okay, so you had your, your water um, water research. You had the the um, anthropological aspect yes. of it. And and was there was there another team? Yes, there was a another team member, Lizzie Rosenberger. She was um, doing a, a I unfortunately don't know the name at the moment but she was doing classroom teaching for all across America. So she was doing remote teaching where she was all around the world, in this case Cambodia, teaching young children live lessons of what she was doing there. So her focus was the, the study of, there was an aviary that was in the area. We were also doing wildlife studies. And for this one specifically, there's two. One is the endangered Mekong dolphin, freshwater dolphin. And another one is a turtle that's also there, and both of those are endangered species that the Cambodian government wanted a census on, hmm. that we all worked together to make sure that was completed. Interesting. So had you met any of these people prior to going on this expedition? No, this was completely, this was first day we arrived in Phnom Penh, we had all our gear, and we meet up on a rooftop of this little hostel, and that was the first time we all met. We had all our gear together saying hello, and. No, I think this aspect of the scientific and adventure community is where that is such a foundation where yeah. you all combine and you all connect that it was, we immediately hit it off. You know, there That's was cool. no tension. There was just everybody was ready to go. But you knew, you knew Alec, right? I did know Alec. And what was Alec along for? So Alec was there to be the, almost a documentarian in his own right. So mm -hmm. he has ex, you know, wonderful art skills and he was doing um, an expedition artist. And he, he was, was on the program a couple of weeks ago. He was on the program. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know the, the work that he was doing is, is amazing. You know, hopefully, uh, in this video in the future, we'll also show some of his work. But being able to preserve very real these aspects of the people that are living there without the camera, and you see it too. You know, whenever he would set up and, and do art, everybody would crowd around. They were fascinated by the work he was doing, and you could see that there was a true difference between sitting down. And, and drawing these families and these situations rather than somebody just taking a snapshot. Huh. Yeah, we, we touched a little bit on that a, a couple of weeks ago when he was in. But that was, that, that's a dream team yeah. for expeditions, man. Like you had, you had everybody. So you met him up and literally like you all drop into Cambodia, Cambodia Pyong Peng, right? Yeah, Pyong Peng. Peng and, and, and just a roof of a hostel. Like everybody meet up <laughs> at this hostel at like what time, like five, 5 p.m. on this date, everybody get there with all your stuff, right? Yep. So how long did you have before, like, you, I guess you got signed on to this expedition and you had to show up? So it took some convincing, mainly because of my other obligations at the moment. But in the end, he got me and I had less than two weeks to prepare. Wow. Thankfully, you know, I'm not, I'm not a stranger to adventure, so I had kind of my go pack and everything that needed to be done. But it was a very, very quick turnaround for sure. But I think that added a little bit to it. You know, you don't get to overthink it. You're just like, all right, I got all my stuff. 
I know right. where I need to be. Let's go. Right. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> so when you sh showed up, did you guys have like some prep time to get everything together? Like who, who is in charge of the gear? Did they have all the gear ready for you? This was that company or what? So we, we have one, uh, the trip leader's name, Garrett Cooper, and he mm -hmm. runs Feral Expeditions, which is a, it's a great organization that runs trip all around the world. Um, yeah, another one is in the Amazon, for instance. Mm -hmm. And their entire, you know, premise is this idea of taking you outside of your comfort zone. You know, a lot of times we have these trips around the world where everything is accounted for, every little thing is ready, and, and that's not really what life is like. And for him to be able to push that and say, we want to bring adventure back into your life, you know, that was also part of the trip, which was him bringing all the equipment that we needed. We have inflatable rafts that we then pumped up and got ready on the actual trip and on the side of you know, the river on a little, yeah. on a little sand bank. So um, had you been kayaking before that, this trip? Yes, I, I have some experience in whitewater rafting, Colorado River, some in East Asia. Um, but this was definitely a different experience because the, the, ter the terrain of the river was so variable. You know, you would uh -huh. go from these large, almost lake-like kind of tributaries to these tiny little, like, tiny river streams where you're getting out of your boat, you're carrying half your stuff on one, you have your boat on your left shoulder, you have all your packs on the right shoulder, you're brushing yourself through you know, like all these little brushes and tree stumps and it is, it's definitely it was all over the place. Wow. But we were always pretty much in the middle of nowhere. So these were single person kayaks? Single inflatable. person kayaks. We did have one safety kayaker with us, uh, Sydney Everson. What's a safety kayak? A safety kayak is uh, one of the more experienced kayakers okay. who is a, has less of a load, who can, at the moment's notice, jump in if something goes wrong, if somebody flips, or if you know you get stuck somewhere that you don't know how to get out of, they're there to help. Uh -huh. But uh, we definitely got into some areas where that might have done very little to help us in that situation. Right. <laughs> so you started in Pyongyang, and and you moved out. Where where did you go from there, and how did you get there? So we all piled into tiny little buses. Uh, it's like a, just a little small minivan, basically. And we had all our gear in another truck that met us on the way. And we all the way from Phnom Penh, which is somewhere in the south of Cambodia, went through all the little side roads all the way up to the top, to the border. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're going through, you know, the most bumpy dirt roads where nobody's on to stop by the side of the river. And here you are. Let's get going. You know, you have the dam on one side yeah. and the rest of the river on the other. And this is that dam that's under construction right yeah. at the border. Yeah, which was interesting because uh, Garrett, who has been there earlier to just kind of scout and you know, assess the area, even in the short time that he was gone, the, the change is massive in that area where you have, you know, the, the dam is ripping up entire communities on the side and certain places that were thriving are now non-existent. Some places that didn't exist at all are now, you know, a small village. So mm. the change there is very drastic, even over a short amount of time. So he was surprised when he showed up? And yes, definitely. Huh. All right, so you jump in the river. And so, so was there like, so, so you jump in the river and was there like a route or did you have like um, waypoints that you had to do observations at or what was the deal? So we, we set up completely on, on, on the riverbank there. So there was, there was no kind of idea of a like campground or anything that was formal. Right. And the aspect because you can never have a formal route going down to Mekong because it's so seasonal the way it floods. So certain passages that are open during one time when you're down there are all of a sudden completely non-existent another time that you go. And that was kind of one of the issues that we would run into is that you know, we would come to a certain point in the river and be like, well, last time Garrett was here, this looked this way. Now it does not. So you're just completely off the, off the reservation. Yeah. Is this a picture of, of you guys um, before you took off? Yes, that is a, actually that is a little bit halfway in between. Halfway. Halfway in between. You guys look pretty good halfway. That's yeah. That's a clean flag. <laughs> that was a stuck away in our, in our day pack. So let's see what you got there. You got the inflatable kayak. You got the Adventures Club flag. Great job, Alec, for bringing that. Yep. You've got a, what is that, a quarter dome T2? Yeah, that's a, we shared that. Yeah. It's a little close quarters, but, you know, that's, that's the, the life that and you live out in the field. That's basically all your gear. I, I can't tell if there's more gear behind that, or, but you guys travel pretty light, huh? Yeah, we, tra we travel pretty light. Most of the stuff, you know, we, we kind of scrounge up from the surround. So any firewood or any extra aspects, we made do with what we found. Did you have to start a lot of fires? Yeah, every night we would go around and look for, for fire starters. Why'd you have to start a fire? Well, 
One is because the mosquitoes oh, yeah. and, the, and the general wildlife. Well, there's nothing really dangerous there. There's definitely things that you just don't really want around your camp. Right. And um, there's always the aspect of community. You know, just having a fire gets mm -hmm. everybody, keeps the morale up. I think for certain members of our trip, it was a little bit more than they were expecting. But having these kind of moments of community it brings everybody together, strengthens the like team. Like in terms of how wild this expedition is? Yeah, was. a little bit. It's definitely like yeah. there are definitely moments where people are like, oh, if I make a mistake, this might be the end because there's not really an aspect for you to get out. There's no, let me just call on a satellite phone and a helicopter will be here in 30 minutes. Yeah, so what was their exit plan? Hope. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but they, didn't, they didn't have a satellite phone? Like no, we, we, we had a satellite phone, but the aspect is no matter what, you're always limited to logistics of the area. So right. even if you do reach somebody and they do understand where you are, the aspect it of might actually take a couple of days for them to put together something. Yeah, and if you get lucky, somehow you might get a helicopter out there. But even that is, you know, that's hoping for something substantial. Right. Interesting. So we, we did have, you know, we had first aid responders, Jeremy Hirschhorn, who was, you know, part of our expedition down in the Arctic, was there, and he was a volunteer firefighter, so he had an EMT experience. Same with Sydney. And so we had all the necessary of being able to stave off the worst in the moment. Yeah. But if you look at the idea of going out into California backcountry, for instance, it's not comparable. Right. Because you can always make a call and they will send a helicopter. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> like they send helicopters all the time when people do stupid stuff. Yeah. I mean, and the thing is, too, is like, you know, you, you can say and you have to ask, like, yeah, we have a satellite phone. What happens if the person in the satellite phone gets swept away? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I, I, I've always wondered this. Like, I have a spot satellite messenger, right, which comes with rescue insurance, and they theoretically have, like, this network of emergency services. Yeah. And I always do wonder, because I never validated, you know, the logistics, like, if you're going to this area, like, hey, spot, like, if I'm in this area, like, what's your plan? Yeah. Like, when I light this thing off and tell someone to go get me, who's going to come and get me? Yeah, absolutely. You know? And there, there's always an, a, just an extra step of risk involved in anything that's water-related. Right. You know, if, you, if we're going out and we're hiking and somebody falls off a cliff, you know, that's kind of the worst in the things that you can imagine. But if somebody you know, gets dragged into a rapid, all of a sudden they're pinned. Yeah. You know, that's like that. Yeah, so you can drown in six inches of water, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So it definitely had its, its risks, but it's something I think that we all took in stride and you know, made part of that adventure. So what did you guys take along to eat? Not a lot. <laughs> yeah. So um, the, the provisions were rather militant. You know, we have, I think, a, a jar. Meter? Militant? Yeah. Military eats great. We've got MREs. Man. Yeah, okay, then, then less than that. <laughs> yeah. You didn't have any MREs? No, we had like no. Like dehydrated stuff? No, none of that. I think our provisions were local fruit. Uh, some pack of ramens, yeah, a uh, classic jar of peanut butter and some flour tortillas. Wow! I remember one of the evenings, you know, we did, you know, we're doing like nine, ten, if not more, hours of pure paddling. You know, no, like this, the stops are us putting our feet up and drifting for a second mm -hmm. for like a, a moment of respite. But uh -huh. um, other than that, after that many hours, you're sitting down around the fire and you get a tortilla, like a Thin layer of peanut butter, some uh, peanuts sprinkled, and uh, congratulations, that's your dinner. Good wow. job, well done. <laughs> what is this? Some sort of food stuff? Uh, uh, yeah. That's a, so, like, so once we ran out of our normal provisions, we had uh, rice, I think one head of cabbage, and then we spent like the good part of an evening that we did have daylight scrounging for ants to add as protein Wow. Because it is a local delicacy that uh, yeah. we got to experience. Our, our guide, Yak Do, um, great guide, super cool, um, very knowledgeable in the local area. He's a local farmer there that was helping us kind of traverse the area and being a translator for Khmer um, was a big part of being able to kind of find the local things like, oh, this is edible. And yep, you can add this to your dish and add a little bit more calories. So it was meager pickings, but we made it through. Have you heard of Mountain Kitchen? <laughs> I have not. You know, the little dehydrated oh, okay, backpacking yeah. Yeah, meals? Yes, yes. They're fantastic. No, we didn't have I mean, those. I'm not going to eat one of those, like, tonight, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, but those things, I, I mean, the, the, the level that, like, backpacking meals are at this day are really good. Yeah. Lasagna with meat sauce, my personal favorite. No, I, I think that's, 
you know, you, to its own extent, that might be a, a part of the feral expedition. I think yeah. the idea of pushing yourself a little bit more where what you can accomplish with the meager rations that you do have. And we did. I, I think to whatever opinion you might have about what is actually available to us, in the end, every single member pulled through. That's and, true. And that was something I think that all of them look at, you know, look back at and say, like, yeah, you know, sure, we didn't have a lot, but you we managed some to weight? do. Oh, yeah, all of us lost. How much weight. weight did you lose? <laughs> I think I lost at least 20 pounds. I think 20 pounds? Al Alec lost something more than that. Holy crap. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you weigh? Uh, I weigh 175 now. And, and 20 pounds might be a little more now, but I think I hit like 155 or 160, something in there. Holy crap. In a week. In a week. Oh, I mean, geez. we're... Well, you were so active, right? You yeah. said you're paddling for 9, 10 hours. And, and, and the thing is just like, I mean, we were paddling. This yeah. wasn't this or you know, portage in your crap over yeah. mud and yeah, exactly and then and, and you know over sandbanks and fighting ourselves through brush and but the, the aspect it was always active and yeah. it, w it wasn't like we're kind of drift even though it was down river it was always something where you know I think I think really most of the time you're you're pushing yourself the entire time mm -hmm. this isn't an aspect where like okay I'm just doing a little bit of this. We had distance to cover. We had scientific goals we needed to achieve in certain periods. We had time crunch constantly. So the aspect of pushing yourself to your physical limit, to your mental limit, was part of this expedition. Do you know how far you traversed over the whole week? I think week? it came down to over 150 kilometers. 150 kilometers. So Down. that's, we'll call that 30 kilometers a day. Yeah. Is that right? If, yeah, and we had some other things in terms of if we would stop, we would hike in, take some samples of other stuff, and then come out. So it was a very mixed bag of always being active. Right, right. But 30 kilometers a day. Yeah. And what is that, 15 miles a day? That's a legitimate paddle, right? Yeah. I think, I think it was more than 150 in the end. I think that's just roughing it at the moment. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, that's still, that's still quite, a, quite a long ways, especially if the paddling's not clean. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, that, I mean, that's and it's a, you know, and to be to be honest, that 150 minimum is a straight line. Oh wow! So it's way more than wow. That. This was this was a legit like <laughs> yeah, workout. This was a legit huh. every day. I mean, it's like if you look at some of the map, like if you had a satellite map pulled up uh -huh. right now, it isn't down. It's like. Did anybody like stop? Take a we got to go over here and track your route. We we had some. I have a map somewhere that you know we can post on the website or something to show some of our scientific measurements as well. But it really was all over the place. I mean, there's moments where you look on the map, and from one river bend to the next, it's like nothing. You could hike over it. Yeah. But the way it snakes around, you're just doing this. Yeah. The entire time, and some of that stuff was you doing this while they're like four different rivers intertwining, and then you gotta get off, move all your stuff into the next one, move it over. All of a sudden, it's, it's just this entire wire cage of brambles and bushes that block your way, so you gotta either take that apart or take everything up, pick it up, one boat over one shoulder, your pack over the other, you're hiking through the forest, through the jungle, you come to a little bit of water, you repack all your stuff, and you're on for like the next 15 minutes until you have to do it all over again. Huh. <laughs> yeah, and you and you're you're navigating the ground. You don't have like the satellite view of this thing, right? No. Or if, is the satellite view even accurate? Yeah, I mean, or does it change the, so often that? Yeah, I mean that's the, that's the thing. Unless you had like a live picture, it it wouldn't matter because you know through the seasons, so much is changing. You know, you always at least have the aspect of like, okay, the river is going somewhat south. We'll find uh -huh. it eventually, going through these brambles and these bushes. And then where where where's this picture here? Is this um? So this is in a a small floating village on one of the largest lakes in Cambodia. That's so where this is a lake because this looks pretty wide open. Yeah. So that lake is um is home to of a, a community of floating villages, and the way they work is through the seasons. They move their entire village. They will actually tow it out into the lake or close to the shore, depending on what time of season it is. Hmm. And one of the reasons that we were there was for the wall analysis because their entire ecosystem, how they substantiate themselves, all the fishing, you know, they, a massive alligator farm. Is there an all yeah, alligator farm? They're farming there. alligators? Yeah, so that's actually one of the... Oh, oh my God, there they are. There they are, exactly. Um, Whoa. So, um, so th they're just underneath a cage. 
in, in like an alligator pile. They're actually Jeez, that's pretty terrifying. much under every home. So they're actually one of the largest exports in that area because per alligator, if it's either for their meat or if it's for their skin that is still being exported, they make, you know, 500 something dollars around. 500 that's give, bucks give per or take. So depending on where they bring it to. And the aspect of that is that it's become such a large economy in that area that almost every single home that we went to is <laughs> it's sitting on floating barrels and next to those barrels is a big cage with tens of these in almost every single home. I mean, it's, it's, we, so we spent one of the evenings, you know, one of the lucky moments that we had where we're not out in the field is we're staying with a small family as a local homestay and you're, <laughs> you're sleeping right above these alligators. I mean, like, like you have like thin wire fence and then the first layer of the floor and then us, and you hear them all night long. That's thrashing. terrifying. It's that is absolutely <laughs> terrifying. It's even more terrifying. What terif if you have a baby? <laughs> Wait, did they have babies? I'm sure of they course, had babies. And, and those babies are running around and you know <laughs> the platform slip into the alligator pit that's beneath your home. It's, it's funny. We were actually more it's worried a literal about death trap. We were more worried about Alec because we were staying in with some other locals, and you know these are people that are living. You know, it's it, the interesting dynamic is they're in the middle of nowhere. We were the first Westerners and foreigners they have ever met. You know, even they don't ever go into any of the larger cities, Phnom Penh, Siem Reap, they've never been to. We're the first Westerners they've ever met. And you have this interesting aspect where they've skipped like several steps of technology, where they're there with a car battery that's connected to their wireless speaker and their little 4G phone, hmm. but they're still in the middle of nowhere and you know, living in, in small houses that are raised. So the reason we're worried for Alec is because he's a big guy and he literally broke through one of their floors because he was so big and heavy. Into the alligator death trap? So that was, thankfully, that was the one house that didn't have one. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, that's crazy. Put that picture back up. That, look at them. They're just waiting to eat you too. Yeah. I mean, alligators don't eat people, right? But they would eat a baby. Oh, if you've... I wouldn't jump in there. Uh, if if anybody falls in there, that doesn't good for them. Yeah. So the thing is, we're, you know, we're lying there trying to sleep, and they're loud. Like, they are hissing and going at it, and they're wrestling. All of a sudden, you know, we're all lying. Do they wrestle hard? They wrestle hard enough to where we're lying there, trying to sleep, and all of a sudden it goes, Poof, because they're hitting the floorboards oh my God. <laughs> when they're wrestling. Oh, I, I've seen some alligators wrestle in the wild, and that was terrifying, because normally they're just, like, chilling there, being lazy lizard, right? You're like, oh, look at you, lazy lizard. Yeah. You just kind of slide no, they're, up they're them. But when they go a after it, like, it's like, oh, my God, these things are, are, are monsters. Yeah, and they're loud, too. Yeah. I mean, they're, they were loud, thrashing. You could see the floorboards go, oof, oof, oof. And then you're lying <laughs> on top of it, so you feel it, and you're like, okay. Like, cool, 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 cool. So I'm fine, I'm fine. Did you have any alligator meat on this trip? Maybe. Possibly. What do you mean, maybe? No, that's yes, so of course delicious. we did. Of course yeah, we that's, did. that's like a... I, I'd say of all the stuff that you said you've eaten on this trip so far, alligators are most thing, the thing I'm most excited about. Yeah, we, had, Florida, we had some alligators. Place, right? Alec was a little bit more of the adventurous type. He had some scorpions and some local yeah. spiders that he partook in. Well, I don't know about all that. It's weird. But alligator, there is nothing wrong with alligator. Kind of yeah. tastes like a chewier chicken, right? How much yeah. did you eat? Uh, we, it came in a soup. Oh, okay. So we had some alligator soup, and it was presented to us as kind of like a local, like, we're glad to have you here, and we're very grateful to accept. And it was definitely, you know, it's an aspect of the culture that we wanted to embrace. Oh, man, I, I, would, have, I would have been all over that <laughs> after that ant soup that you guys yeah, had. Yeah, definitely. I'd be like, that alligator, a, this is a, amazing. An upgrade, for sure. That was an upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> so this is you guys paddling down the river, right? Yep. You got quite the mask on. Which one's you? I can't. Even I'm tell. the one on the right side. The Alec the right. is the one on the left. I mean, that's that's the aspect is, you know, we're out there for hours and hours at a, at a time, nine to ten. And this and is chop that you're hitting. Is this yeah. windy chop? Um, kind of. That's starting to lead into some of the white water that we had. Okay. And you know, we had these different. We hit a lot of different types of rapids. You know, we had some of the where they would just go on for a really long amount of time, but it was rather flat and shallow and wide. But then a little bit more is kind of when you get into those smaller world, all of a sudden kind of 
you have larger sand banks that have a rockier bottom, and then mm -hmm. you get channeled in like a little slide. But when you have just fallen over trees and brushes and right. everything in your way, it's, it becomes, especially with inflatable rafts. Right, they're not maneuverable. <laughs> yeah, they're not maneuverable, and the idea of popping one while you're in the middle of a rapid and everybody is like several feet behind you, you're kind of like, yeah. all right, I gotta perform in this moment. Anybody ever lose it? No, thankfully not. We did Nobody have some. Lost it. We Nobody had some overboards, okay. but you know, we we were all there, so we were should bring them back in. And right, yeah, well, you're not exactly Eskimo rolling these things, right? No, no, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> so, um, you go down the river. You're stopping in some villages along the way. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Um, five days out, basically, um, and then wh where do you end up? So we kind of hit, you know, we're going down the entire river and the way that it was set up is that you're pretty much in the middle of nowhere. So there's really no kind of established settlements or roads that you could lead out of. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, you kind of are making a little turn that comes into the actual like first aspects of main civilization. So main people are where you can, there's hotels, there are people that you can stop. Well, hotels is a, a rest stop, you could right. say. And they rent rooms. Yes, gotcha. they rent rooms. <laughs> And that was one of the, you know, the first stops that we had. And then we also had several other stops you know, on the main river, on the main lake, and then around Phnom Penh, we did some more um, water sampling in that area. But you, were, you weren't staying in hotels at that point. You were no, still no. camping out? Yeah, yeah, we're still camping out. Huh. So, so did you got out in Phnom Penh? Uh, we got out a little bit before Phnom Penh in a smaller village whose name I, I unfortunately don't But at remember. the end of this trip, so you went from like, you went from the dam Right, that was this weird dam in the middle of nowhere that was totally changing the local landscape and everything. Down the river that was middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. small villages and stuff, but very isolated. And then you turn the bend and you start seeing civilization. Yeah. And you're kind of you're in this this river that is one of the most polluted rivers in the world. Yeah. In the middle of civilization. Yeah. What was it like when you saw that civilization around the corner? Well, it was definitely. <laughs> we were we were so. The first thing, besides any of the scientific achievement or any of those, was our need for food. There was, yeah. <laughs> there was this one tiny little restaurant. I mean, it's really like a platform that sits out over the river. And we completely cleared them out. To the, <laughs> like, to the point where they said, I'm sorry, we don't have any more food. Wow. And they looked at us as like, we're the crazy Westerners that are coming in and are like ordering a massive amount of food that was right. all eaten, like completely it was gone. And I mean, it was a feast for what you would think of like 12, 15 people that are tiny crew. Right. That consumed in like an, for sure. in an hour. Just cleaned out this Just restaurant. Just cleaned out this restaurant. Oh my God. Uh, completely. I'll tell you, I, I do kind of object, object to this aspect of your expedition, right? Mm -hmm. Because I've, I've done some stuff and I know that you can eat well in the back country. And for me, that's one of the fun parts is to make sure that everybody eats well, whether you're sailing or backpacking or whatever. Like we always put a cook on there and we're like, yep. we're, and we eat so well. We, I mean, we'll lose like two pounds. You'll lose a little bit of weight because you're way more active. But I mean, that's, that's one of the parts, like you said, the campfire, right? That, that's so fun to gather around. We would gather around and we'd see what kind of meals we can make. Like, you know, we make pizza where we're like, you know, handmade bread from flour and stuff like that. That, that. That's a fun part for me. So I object a little bit to how hungry you guys were on this. <laughs> but I also appreciate how wild it is, right? And you're really pushing those boundaries. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think it's an aspect in, in certain ways is, you know, we live in such a comfortable society in such a comfortable way that many of us have not really felt what real hunger is. The yeah. idea of like being out of two to three days of food where you're really running low is something that most of us have never experienced. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a lot to be said about being able to bring all those things. And we have the capabilities of MREs and things. But I think that's one of the aspects of the Feral Expedition, what they stand for, and the scientific equipment that we had, all the stuff that we had to have with us. And it is something to be able to push yourself. That's one of those experiences that we have where it's like, yeah, I can do this. This yeah. is something, sure, it might have been difficult, I could have been hungry, but in the end, we accomplished every single one of our objectives, no matter how difficult in that moment that time was. You know, that's an interesting aspect. It's an interesting thought, right? Because in, in essence, I think we might have lost that skill. And I think about like, um, for example, you know,
know these the beaver trappers? These guys would leave like New York and they'd go up into Canada like in the winter mm-hmm. for like six months. So you guys got by with, with you know, the extra body weight, right? Which will, will sustain you for quite a long, <laughs> you know, like, Amer- like we eat pretty well, right? So we got, we got plenty to lose, right? So if we're, we could go for like a month, right? And we could have enough calories just kind of hanging on our bodies to get through, right? And like when we see these shows like Naked and Afraid where they don't have any food, you kind of see them just, you know, use the fat on their bodies. Yeah. But then I think about these guys that were like trappers, right? That went out there and they didn't go for a week or a month or two months. They went for like a whole season in the winter. And that not only did they, you know, survive it, right? They thrived. Somehow they were able to completely live off the land up in northern Canada with no, like they, 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 weren't, they weren't walking around with a sack of rice on their yeah. back. So how did they do that? Did we lose that skill as society? I think an aspect is that, I, I believe Teddy Roosevelt put this in a nice way. We did the idea of that we're always coming up with things of, to make those things easier. Mm-hmm. You know, when if you think of your the, the, the best modern you know, camping pads and all the equipment that we have and the best tents and all these things that make you feel like if you were at home, if you can make things as comfortable where you're basically at home in the wild, why are you in the wild? And these are some of the things where you're pushing yourself for a reason. There is something positive to be said about putting yourself into a situation that you're not comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And we are putting so much pressure on ourselves to always make it like, yeah, let me get the best gear and all these things so I don't have to worry about those things. Maybe we should worry a little bit. Maybe we should have those skills to make us more capable people that in those situations we can provide for ourselves. How far do you push it though? Like, you're gonna wear some wool socks? <laughs> you're gonna wear a wool shirt? You know, like think about just like the synthetic fabrics that we have and how much better that makes life. Sure. Oh my God, how much better is life with a synthetic shirt on than like a cotton shirt mm-hmm, or something? Mm-hmm. And, and the answer to that is always, is that it depends on the person and the experience that you want. There's no one size fits all there's going to be people that are just getting into the idea of what an adventure is or going out there. Where, you know, I would never talk down to somebody that wants to go camping in their backyard and then move up to just around to the back mountains of wherever they're living. As long as you're taking the steps to push yourself to do something new, to push your limits just a little bit more, I think that's also what the Adventurous Club stands for, the way that I see it, is that, yeah, we have a lot of ability to make ourselves as comfortable as possible. Mm-hmm. Is that always the best thing for us? I don't believe so. We can all find our own perfect niche of where you're pushing yourself just a little bit further every single time. So I'm interested to know where you are at on that spectrum, because I'll tell you where I'm at. I want to go as far as possible, as remote as possible, as out of the way as possible, but be as comfortable as possible doing it, you know? And I want to go so far that I couldn't like go in an RV or something like that. And I wouldn't want to take a helicopter to the top of a mountain and say I went there, right? Not, not that, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. as far as I can, remote as I can, the most difficult journey that I can possibly imagine, but do it in the most possible comfort. That's the type of person I am. Okay. So what type of person in that aspect are you? I think the most important aspect to me is pers- personal capability. If you can... Most of the skills that you will pick up and know, if you can have that be your own skill rather than relying on a tool or something that you have to bring with you, that is ideal. Sure, having a fire starter is nice, and I think I would bring that as well. But knowing in the back of your head that if you didn't have that tool, that you can still make a fire is extremely important to me. Because there, you can plan for everything out in the middle of nowhere. But you know that the moment you actually are out there, there are things that can go wrong all the time. You could hit a snag. You could lose your entire backpack. You could lose all your gear. Mm -hmm. And you will never be comfortable in that moment. But are you able to at least have those skills to where you say, okay, I can get myself out of this situation? Right. And that's something that I think is is important. And we all have different ways of doing that. And nobody's going to have all the skills and is a survival expert. But yeah. you should at least have the aspect for yourself where you say, like, yes, I'm going to put myself into a situation where I know I can get myself out of if problems do arise, which a lot of times they do, no matter how much you prepare for it. I like that. Yeah. That's a good way to do it. <laughs> it's nice to have that, you know, because that, 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 that is a good point. Like, if you have the luxury items, right, they can always fail. Yeah. 
right? Some of them it's pretty hard to fail. Like for instance, with the fire starting, I, I know how to like do like the friction start and all that kind of stuff. I have never had a Bic lighter fail on me, ever, yeah. ever. Have you had a Bic lighter fail? I've not, but what happens if you lose it? <laughs> if you lose it, that's, that's a, a good point, yeah. right? But um, that, that, that's, that's a really interesting aspect. But it, that goes into everything, right? Like fire start is one aspect, but very simple things that are an absolute necessary aspect of wilderness survival and just being out in the wild. You're not in society. Mm -hmm. Knowing how to find your compass direction, knowing where the North Star is, the idea of basic first aid. If you twist your ankle, if you break something, do you know how to make the basics of a tourniquet? You know, these are all little things where out in the world, when you're really out there, they're like little things that just the, the capability that you have can save your life. Yeah. And you don't necessarily always want to rely on something that you could lose or you can break. You know, if it's on you, if you have that skill, that, I think that makes you more capable out in the world and ready for whatever yeah. comes. It is interesting to know how, how much we rely on society. Like when we, when we live in the city, right, we do have an enormous support structure behind us. What happens when that goes away? Do, or is anybody ever really aware of, of how incredible the support structure of modern civilization is? Absolutely. And I, th I think what's, what's w not necessarily, you know, worrisome might be a strong word, but the aspect is that our society is so interconnected and our economy is as well. And the aspect is that everything around us, everything that you're picking up in the grocery store that you think is always there, that is getting there just in time. They're not hundreds of warehouses everywhere that's stocking everything. That was from the past. Now it's all a complex logistical system that is making sure that whatever you need gets there the night beforehand so it's ready in the store the next day. Mm -hmm. If you somewhere in that supply chain stop it, you have serious issues. I think even just now with the with COVID nineteen. The toilet with, paper thing? Yeah. You know like in, in, in that, you know, we look at that now as almost like you know, like a joke where we're like, oh, the toilet paper. But if you look at, for instance, on a more serious note, cancer patients, people that had to deal all those things of disinfectants and, and diapers and toilet paper and wipes, all these things that are necessary for their survival are no longer there, that is a real threat. Mm -hmm. And these things, they very much firsthand experienced the issue of having a system that is so dependent on things getting there just in time because the supply is not there. That's wild, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's a little scary. It's a little, it's, but that's like the aspect of, you know, that's the security versus, you know, like how we, we're living in our world. It's this stuff that we kind of give up. Yeah. Where we say, okay, I am contributing my time to other skills to make me capable, you know, in the field that is necessary in society while giving up more things of like, oh, yeah, if the water is shut off, yeah. How do I get more water? You know, oh, what yeah. is a solar still? Yeah. You know, all these different ways that we're kind of, we're kind of it's a give and take. It's a trade-off to right. live in our society. So at the end of this expedition, I want to get to this because y you did have a scientific purpose. Mm -hmm. What did you learn? Like, what was the what was the outcome of this? Did you guys publish a paper? Or what, what what what's happened with that? So Re Rebecca Ziegler and I, who was the other water technician, are currently in the process of writing a scientific paper. Um, we're waiting on some information from the Cambodian Ministry of Agriculture and the Cambodian government. During COVID, unfortunately, those has been delayed a little bit. Mm -hmm. But kind of preliminary findings is that it's not looking great. So if you, if you look at the major rivers in Asia broadly, they're one of the largest polluters of plastics in the world. You know, when we, when we look at what's actually out there, it, and what is being pumped out into our ocean it is, is a massive influx of, you know, you could literally took all, take all of Europe and it doesn't compare to what is being pumped out by some of, like just a few of these rivers hmm. from Asia. But uh, what we saw there is that unfortunately the problem is, is so much more widespread and built into the landscape. And I mean literally built into the landscape. You know, we're in the middle of nowhere, we have these tiny villages and even they have random disposable plastic bags and little paper chip bags that are made of aluminum. And that culture still has this aspect of where you know, they don't quite know the full consequences of the impact of their land. So they're taking whatever they have, open it, finish, throw it on the ground. They're still 
burning some of their trash in the morning when we were there. And you see it because there's such extreme seasonal flooding in that area is in every aspect of the landscape. I mean, you're looking at the fields and you see little plastic bags that are being decomposed, well, not decomposed, they're being broken down by the UV radiation. Mm -hmm. And they're just breaking down smaller and smaller and smaller, literally lining their fields. So you can see when it. When it degrades though, isn't that a good thing? So unfortunately not. So it's not a biodegradable aspect where you have a natural compound that is then biodegraded and used back in the environment. Like you said, it photodegrades though, right? Yeah, so the, the, the aspect of UV radiation is that it's breaking down these plastic molecules, especially something like styrofoam, for instance, is that it's breaking down so much that it's just smaller and smaller. It doesn't disappear. So for most normal things, when you think of like aluminum, for instance, it rusts away to a point where it becomes kind of part of the landscape and it's like a natural metal in the soil. But with styrofoam and plastics, they just get so small that they become small enough to actually be ingested and then leach some of that toxicity into your system. And you have this everywhere. So every time when the floods come in, you see all this plastic trash that's being taken from the fields and put up into the trees, into the brushes. I mean, literally, Everywhere. We are going down a part of the river where nobody goes. It's too rough for the boats, even the small ones. But you see in every tree, oh, there's a plastic flipper. Oh, there's some styrofoam. Oh, right, there's a plastic bag on every single leg of that trip. So it's everywhere. It's constantly in that environment. It's going to be, con even if right now they completely stop plastic usage, it is something that will affect them for the next two to three decades. So how long does it take for something plastic to degrade to a point where it's not a problem anymore? The, the issue is that, in a sense, it will always be a problem. You know, the, if it was, for instance, just a plastic bottle, that wouldn't be a problem. You can pick up a plastic bottle. It's the same way that we have you know, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch that you hear about it. Mm -hmm. It's not that there's a bunch of plastic that's free floating out in our oceans. It's every part of that plastic bottle broken down. So you would literally take it and you could shred it into microscopic little powder. And that's kind of, if I gave you this piece of plastic powder right there and be like, hey, would you want to ingest this? You'd be like, no. But that's the thing is that it is spread over an entire landscape that is being picked up by smaller animals, like just the idea of biomagnification, is that you have smaller shrimp and krill that are then picking up these microplastics. And then you have hundreds of those shrimp being eaten by a, s a smaller fish. And then that is being eaten by another larger fish. So in the end, you have this massive biomagnification of these plastic residues. That so then it works the same way like mercury would work? Because so we don't process it out of our bodies at all. Yeah, no animals process it out. You just keep it in there and it stays in there? It, it's not quite the same because it doesn't go across the, the blood barrier. But it is an aspect where the toxic chemicals inside will leach. What do you mean it doesn't go across the blood barrier? So, so it goes through your stomach, but yes, it stays so in your intestinal it, tract? It, it goes through your stomach, and it's something that what it, you can think of it as like off-gassing, but really it's a, it's a term of leaching. So it uh -huh. will leach certain chemicals that are interacting with your actual bi you know, biochemistry. And your mercury, for instance, is something that is on the same level, but much more intense, because it will actually directly mix with your inner systems. Hmm. So the mercury as of itself will pass into your bloodstream, but the plastics that you have will leach off harmful chemicals into your bloodstream. Hmm. And it's so much of it in a sense, because it's so small and there's so much surface area that you're constantly ingesting it if you're in that local wildlife and you're eating you know, the fish and the birds. So you say they also burn their trash. Yes. Why would they burn it if they're just throwing it on the ground? Well, I mean, aside from plastics making excellent fire starters. Well, I, th I think the aspect is, is they still see, you know, like they don't have the aspect of these m massive trash heaps that they're buried. Like a landfill is mm -hmm. not something that's there because the infrastructure isn't there. You know, these are small communities that don't even have roads that lead to them. So sure, they don't want to have one place to put all their trash and they don't want it in their fields, you know, except for like the children that are running around that they, you know, that are doing their thing. So they are taking whatever trash they have and burning it because it's the easiest way of disposal without necessarily being aware of the negative health consequences. So generally, the, the culture is they'll take a bag and they'll just throw it in the field. But then at some point, someone kind of gets fed up with all the trash that's around and they'll kind of collect it up and burn it. So it's, it's more is that people 
are using the trash and they kind of will put it in one general area and then burn it, for instance, that next morning or at the end of the week, whatever their cycle is. But you still have, you know, with, you know, this isn't like a, the way of a city. You have a small dirt path with two rows of certain huts along the side and the trash is always going to, you know, if it's kids, if it's dogs, if it's wind, yeah, it's, gonna get blown it's just going to yeah. get blown around. And I'm, from just a general aspect, you're literally, you know, we're watching, talking to people, we're just you know, having some snacks, and they're open something, they're talking to you, and then they're like, oh, okay, great, and then they throw it on the ground. Hmm. And you're kind of watching it, and you're like, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not going to say anything. And that's why you're there. Yeah. That's why you're like, oh, man, this is the issue that I'm here for. So um, do you have any preliminary results from this study back yet? Um, I mean, is it there, I don't want to go into the specifics because things need to be double-checked also yeah. by, by them, but uh, the aspect is that plastics are on the rise. And so generally, like based on what, what you can tell me, is it worse than you thought it was going to be or, or on par? It, or? It, is, it is worse by standards that we already know, which are not good. Okay. So uh, I think that the, the, the thing that we took away from it the most is how integrated those plastics are, even though they've been only available for a very short amount of time, relatively. You know, I, th I think they're asked the same way that you're skipping these things of where they don't have landlines, but they have cell phone towers. Mm -hmm. So you're in the middle of nowhere, but they have a smartphone, which is interesting. But the aspect is the same. It's like all the local ways of like, oh, let's, you know, we have you know, certain baskets that we're using for transportation or clay pots. They're being phased out because it's so much easier to just get your plastic bag in a roll of 300 if you do go to a small town nearby. Right. And that's something where that convenience is usurping the actual positive environmental impacts of having your own baskets or your clay pots. So, you know, what is, I mean, obviously the solution is turn off the, turn off the source, right? Don't use plastics for this stuff. But what, what do we do with all these plastics that are already out there? How do you dispose of them? You photodegrade them, they just get smaller, right? And, and, and more, they, if they get smaller, they're more of a problem for uh, wildlife and yeah. biologics. Right, uh, so then, so what? You throw them in a landfill? You burn them? They go into the air, release har harmful chemicals I mean, in the air. Un unfortunately, that is on the end of that step. It's because the first step is collecting it all, and that that you know, even what is already out in the landscape is enormous. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the point where I'm making. When you're you're going down a very remote part of the river, while it is the main river as well, you still have these rather untraversed parts, and you see it everywhere. Where's I, it coming from? That dam. All the workers from the dam are everywhere. Their stuff I mean, out. any local community that is anywhere along the river where most of that is, which you know, there's still many parts that are kind of unsettled in a sense, uh -huh. but it is something that is just naturally because everything is their entire ecosystem slash community and infrastructure is built along the sides of the river, and because the flooding is so intense, is that you have somebody that's living, you know. 50, 60 miles up the river and like 30 miles inland is all their farming work, all their plastics and those bushes, that all gets swept up into the river the next time there's a large flood. And collecting the entire plastic waste that is all around Cambodia and along the river is, you know, a massive feat. So the, the issue in terms of how do you get an entire community or a nation, you know, I think this is another other aspect of you know, climate change in general, is you have the Western and the, the, the rest of the world basically been using this technology and all these plastics for so long for then say, hey, sorry, you can't use that. <laughs> you know, like, I know it's super convenient and it's been making your life way better. We do that a lot of stuff, right? Yeah, but it's like, uh, sorry, you can't use that yeah. now because it's going to have an environmental impact. You're like, what? Right. Like, I'm using this right now. Like, why, why am Nuclear I... Nuclear power, gasoline, asbestos, you know, all, yeah. all, all the stuff that we used for... For years, and then we—I mean, to be fair, someone have to, someone had to figure out that it was a bad idea, you know. Yeah. But I, but I get it, you know. The, the 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 aspect is, you know, this is getting more into the political aspects of how the geopolitics of that region. But to say and to leave them to their own devices and say, hey, you have to change without any outside help or intervention to make that transition easier. You know, how are you going to ask an entire? people living you know, where they're dependent on these disposable plastics yeah. to just make that change immediately without any incentive is extremely difficult. Hmm. 
Yeah, yeah that's a tough one. Yeah. All right, so um, we, we've been live this whole time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> yes. But we've got, we've got a chat going on there, and I'm sure we've got a lot of questions in the chat because this, this was a pretty fascinating topic. Yep, we got, we got quite a few. So um, if you don't mind, we'd like to take some questions from the viewing audience here. So Andy, um, cue us up. All right. So first of all, welcome everyone to the chat this week. It's lovely to see your smiling faces, and I'm so glad you were able to tune in to another fantastic show. Uh, our first question comes from Sinclair. Thank you for the question, Sinclair. And Sinclair wants to know, why were rubber rafts used? Are they more rugged than fiberglass or plastic? So the biggest aspect about using rubber rafts was the ability to transport them. That was really the, the main aspect is because the, the environment that we were in was so ever-changing and at a moment's notice we would have to get out, take all our equipment out and move across a sandbank through some jungle into the next area that we could actually put our boats down is that was the easiest way to actually be able to move those, you know, to move our equipment. Because yeah. if you did have a big fiberglass boat, you, wouldn't, you were not going to drag it across the jungle floor to yeah. be able to get to the next body of water. But, so this was, while it might not be the most ideal, and at many times we wish we had something it's else. Definitely not that very hydrodynamic, that's yes. for sure. Not only that, I mean, there, there were moments where the wind was so strong. The, the we're making no headway. Yeah, like, <laughs> we're going <laughs> full, no, full paddle to the max, and we're like, okay, that tree <laughs> is further ahead now. So we, <laughs> we made negative progress. Um, but yeah, it's mainly for transportation and being able to, to move it and be on the go. I would as say much probably just get, like, you know, the, any kayaking trip, trip I've done, you know, they've got a whole trailer full of fiberglass kayaks. Yeah. You can roll this thing up. Yep. It's in a, I mean, imagine the box is like, you know, yay big. Yeah, I so. mean, it was really just, it just rolled up to this, and we had little fill-up bags where you can th think of it as like a giant plastic bag that you would whoosh around in the air. Was it a plastic up. bag? It you basically bastard. was. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's a durable plastic, a durable plastic bag that All you right. would then crimp at the edges, and it had a little valve yeah, that I've you would then those. connect and then push down to be able to fill up that yeah. raft. They've got some Thermarest pillows that do that, which is a fantastic way to fill up your air mattress. All right, next question, Andy. Next question comes from Larry Stern. Larry, thank you for the question. Uh, and Larry wants to know if you could tell us about some of the other adventures you've gone on. Yeah, I heard like Antarctica. Uh, that, was, that was Jeremy. Oh, okay. Um, so a lot of my younger life was kind of traversing around the world. My father worked for Lufthansa, the German airline company. And for any time that we had free time, it was you know, jet setting around the world. So in terms of one specific adventure that I could think of was probably getting to the last base camp of Kachimjunga in the Himalayas. And that I think was, you know, that's a trip that we'll always remember in my life because there, you know, out of many of the wonderful things that we did from you know, visiting monasteries that nobody has been to in a long time where we are one of the few Westerners that ever visit to small mountain villages and meeting yak farmers that have you know, big things of yak cheese and you know, all those small, tiny things. Um, one of the most special moments during that trip was we were at the last base camp. You know, it's snow covered. We're in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. We're the tallest mountain around. You could see Mount Everest in the distance. But it was uh, the middle of the night. And you know, my family were all getting up. And I was like, oh, what's going on? Like, it's the middle of the night. And we get outside, and I thought all of a sudden, it's, oh, it's, it's morning. It's so bright out. There were so many stars in the sky right. that you can't tell them apart anymore. The Milky Way is, is milky. It is this white band across the sky where you can't tell the individual stars anymore. That's and this cool. moment when you're standing there, and there's this perspective shift where instead of you kind of sta standing out looking at it, you realize that you're the spinning ball and that you're looking at a cross section of your galaxy. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a life changing moment in that, in that single moment to be like, oh my God, I am the tiniest speck yeah. in the specks of the universe. And it, it was truly a life changing experience. I will never, you know, that will be always close to my heart. That's cool. Yeah, I miss that. I haven't, se I've, I haven't seen the stars like that in a long time. Yeah. And it is fantastic. Absolutely. I, I, it's something that we miss. Any, anybody that's, if you're watching this and you've been stuck inside because of COVID and in the city, 
see if you can get out there. Someone said that we should have a um, like worldwide turn off the lights day, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> where all the all the all the lights go out. I don't, I don't know how you do that. I think you'd have to just have all the power companies cut the power because <laughs> nobody would comply, right? Just but think about it. All you'd have to do. You just black out all the cities. We do it all the time in California anyway. Just black them out for like, you know, 11 p.m. to 2 p.m. or 2 a.m. in the morning. Just three hours, blackness across all of America. That would be fantastic. Yeah, especially it would be wonderful if it's something that was truly organized. Yeah. I mean, every hobby and professional astronomer oh, would, sure. would, they would, you know, even now we have people that are setting up their own telescopes out in public places. And I think if something was like that was organized, where you could have the call go out, it's like, hey, all you know, amateur astronomers, bring out your gear. Because yeah, because uh, the electric company is going to turn off. Yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way you could do it. You could never get everybody. Everybody would be like, this is stupid. I'm turning on my lights. I, I do believe, though, I wish I had more information, but I think we've done similar things in the past. I think there's really? actual like, times where, as I think it was a memoriam for something huh. or for a special event, certain cities have gone dark. Interesting. That'd be interesting to look up. I'm going to have to check that out. All right, next question, please. Our next question comes from Sinclair again, and Sinclair wants to know, how did you get fresh water? Did you use a filter to generate drinking water from the river? So we had a, a little hand pump that has a built-in charcoal filter that we use mainly for water. Um, but really, we, uh, we actually took all our water with us. Hmm. Um, so we had these large kind of... Um, like skin bags, basically mm -hmm. like plastic, like heavy durable plastic bags that carried all our fresh water. Um, that was pretty much the main way that we kept all our water. And then for any emergency fill-ups, we had a, a hand charcoal That's a lot pump. of weight to carry around. I it thought is you were a lot. trying to go light. I, I so know. So light <laughs> that you couldn't bring a dehydrated backpacking meal. Yep. Uh, that's <laughs> a, that was not part of my logistics. I would have done that differently. <laughs> but it is, I think for an aspect of, of certain things of safety, they wanted to have water. Make but sure even though the, those filters yeah. are perfectly fine. And yeah, if you're, are, if you're out go, there... They can get clogged for sure. Yeah. You know? So yeah, that was, main, that was always the backup. You yeah. know, we had the, the main supply and then the backup to be sure. Yeah. All right, next question, please. Next question is, what did you learn about yourself during the course of this trip? Oh, that's a good one, that personal growth aspect. Mm. I, th I think to be honest, is that I, l I always consider myself somewhat of like a person that likes to take risks and do something different. Mm -hmm. But it was never something where I'm like, oh yeah, like that is something that that is me, you know. But this trip was something where I realized that I l I thrive in an environment that is not structured in a normal everyday sense. I think there's something to be said about, and this isn't an aspect of like, oh my God, it needs to be the most dangerous thing in the world all the time. No, it's, it's having something out of the norm where you're not following a script, you're not following a routine. It is something where it is your decision, your choice matters in what you do from the moment to moment, and I enjoy that. That's something where I really started to embrace and something where like, okay, I wanna do more of that in my life. Yeah. Don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a club full of guys like that. Yeah. All right, next question, please. Next question is, what would you do different next time? Either logistically or personally? Mm, probably bring some more food. Bring those backpacking <laughs> meals for sure. <laughs> uh, well, everything I said about being able to push yourself, a couple of nice meals definitely do good for morale. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, I think I would have, I would have spent more time, had I known a little bit more ahead of time, I think that would have been the biggest thing, is I would have tried to cram in even more scientific aspects. Hmm. Because there's a lot of universities, a lot of scientific organizations that would have loved to have given us some scientific equipment or some sort of project to take along with us to test out in the field or to get more data. And you felt like you had the bandwidth to take on some more stuff? Well, Always. I mean, that's yeah. like, I, I would rather overload myself and maybe not complete a project rather than underload and have, you know, just obviously finish everything and then there's more to be done. Right. Right. So there's always more science to be done. <laughs> awesome. Next question, please. Next question comes from Larry Stern again. And Larry wants to know, does, An I think he means Alec, does Alec snore? <laughs> I don't know, the gators do, though. 
Uh, no, but he tosses and turns like crazy. Jeez, that guy's a liability in this, this gator trap, right? <laughs> Is he going to roll into the gator Yeah, bra breaking oh, no. through floorboards and uh, oh, turning geez. around in the tent. Oh, my God. All right, next question. Uh, next question. By the way, Larry, I do snore. I, I snore thunderously, I'm told. Um, yeah, different tent. Yeah. Uh, next question is, wh uh, what was the best thing that you ate the entire duration of the trip? Mm. Alligator? I wish. Not quite. Um, we were actually, right before we left on our actual expedition, we were in this small, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a town. It's like three huts, mm -hmm. you know, built out of wood. And we were sitting on the side, and they made this... It's 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 like a noodle dish made out of with chicken in it. It's 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 nothing specific. I can't put a name on it, you know. But it was like so fresh. A every single ingredient was made by hand, from the mm -hmm. noodles to the chicken that was still running around like moments beforehand. Yeah, <laughs> you know, from three to two. Wasn't there a chicken right Yeah, pretty pretty much yeah, exactly that. You know, all the lo all everything you could see the garden that they were growing in the past. So like everything was made, not you know maybe. 300 yards radius. Yeah. That's where it all came from. And it was, oh, it was delicious. Absolutely delicious. Delicious. Just yeah, it was, it, it was this curry noodle chicken mixture of something that doesn't have a name because they, it's like a local family recipe. And that was the best. And honestly, those are the kind of experiences I value so much because mm -hmm. you can go to restaurants anywhere and put a name on it. But if it's like, this is my great grandmother's passed down dish with all the local things that you can only find here. Hmm. You know, that, that's what makes some of these things... Hard like, to recreate, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely worth it. All right, next question, please. We have two more questions from the chat tonight. The first one is, what did they use for communications, satcoms or shortwave radio? That comes from Sinclair again. Sinclair and Larry, thank you for the questions tonight. Good question. So um, for our communications, we had shortband radio, so... Like walkie little, uh, yeah, little walkie talkies. Yeah. Um, so for us, it was all very, very short range from the communications that we had. But if you're asking about the larger communications of the locals that we were with, is it's interesting because, like I mentioned before, Cambodia as a whole skipped many steps in the techno technological cycle. It's the same way that when we think of your, your personal computer, your laptop, or your landline, those steps were all skipped. You have the new age technology that is being brought in from other countries. Right. You have 4G towers. I mean, they're, I'll tell you now, their cell phone service and their like payment for their gigabytes is cheaper by us by far. Yeah. Like by far. And it's well, all. It's that leapfrog effect, right? Exactly, exactly. You know, like these companies still have to pay off 3G towers, yep. possibly, you know, or recoup that investment in the least. But if you're putting in a new cell phone tower, why aren't you putting in that 5G? Yeah. I mean, aside from the fact that it gives you COVID, but. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's interesting because, you know, w without looking at it too kind of Western-centric, but the aspect of where we look at these places, even certain remote aspects, you know, in aspects of, of Cambodia, is we kind of expect this, like, certain level of technology to be standard across. But it's mm -hmm. not. You have, you know, these small places that, are kind of barely connected. You have some rickety roads and people are getting there, but they'll have like two to three cell phone stores right next to each other. Hmm. So you have this like advanced level of technology mixing with, you know, still the very traditional aspects. So like what I mentioned before is you're, we're sitting in a non-air conditioned, somewhat drafty wooden house slash hut, and we're listening to broadcasted from a cell phone, like Cambodian techno music, I'm not kidding, hmm. through a, a wireless speaker that's hooked up by like two wires to a car battery that's also powering like one extra single light bulb. Huh. So you're, you're in the middle of nowhere, but you're listening to like a YouTube video that you can watch. And it's that's just crazy. like this, yeah, I mean, and, and it's, in a certain way we experience that now. You know, you're standing on the side of the road, with your Star Trek age technology that is your phone, while like you watch an old Buick go blah, 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 past you. So right. we have this difference of technology, and even there, it's just even further. Yeah. Where they, you know, they're skipping all the steps of a laptop because 
if you have the brand new, you know, Galaxy, whatever it is, you can do everything right there. Yeah. So there's a lot of steps in technology that are just skipped, but everything is still kept in this traditional way. So you really have an interesting mixture of technology and culture. That the, is interesting. I've always, I've always been aware of the leapfrog effect like that, right? And how, how it lets certain countries advance faster, right? Because you, know, you make an investment and then the other country leapfrogs that investment and they're all of a sudden ahead of you. Yeah. But I've never seen it expressed in such a, I've never heard of it being expressed in such a drastic way. That's, that's super interesting. Yeah, a, a big thing you know, for any society that is working on these things is that it's not about the newest technology. It's about last generation's technology becoming affordable for everybody else. Yeah. And you saw that there very much, is that you have this, this wide access of affordable technology that comes together in a very different way than we have here. Yeah. For instance, and this is leading more to certain aspects of social media, is you know, America as a whole, I think, has kind of lost its fascination with things like Facebook. Mm -hmm. you know, we look at that and be like, oh, that's its own thing. You know, now it's like a big calendar for all the birthdays and maybe random people that you're texting. But in countries like Cambodia, for instance, it is an entire infrastructure in and of itself. The people that you're connecting with, you can pay people through it. You have marketplaces. That is a totally different place in their society than it is for us. Hmm. And that's, for instance, where larger companies like Facebook are looking to. If they lose some Americans, sure, that's a big deal, but it's nothing compared to the market that is opening up all around the world. Hmm. That's fascinating. <laughs> all right, last question, Andy. Uh, this is not the final question, but uh, Leon, do you have an Instagram or a social media you'd like to shout out to the folks so they can get in contact with you if they want to find out more? Sure. Um, mainly my Instagram is, I'm not a very social media savvy person. Yeah. I have my own thoughts on that. I won't go into it now, but uh, I do post some of my photography there. It's a leon.g.schoenfeld. So you can just look up my name with the G in the middle and you should be able to find me on Instagram. Sounds good. And we'll put that in the description too so people can find it. All right, final question, Andy? Final question of the night. Uh, before I get into it, I want to thank everyone for coming out. Thanks for all for tuning in, and thank you everyone for the questions. Hope to get more next week, and hope to see more of you back. So, until then, stay curious, stay adventuring. Final question is, how did you cope with the drudgery of being on the river? Was it, was it drudgery, or was it getting beat by the wind, or? Eaten it, by mosquitoes, or <laughs> you know, <laughs> sometimes when, when it sucks so bad, like it's not very drudgery, right? And then you know, you're paddling for an hour straight and you're in that groove, and that's what gets boring, right? It, you know, it's funny, that's that was actually an ongoing joke between Alec and I because okay. we, we have this thing where every single time we're in moments, and like you know, I can think of one specifically, we're in the middle of what was basically a lake in the middle of this river and the headwind is so strong, we're making negative speed because mm -hmm. we're watching the tree go past us. And we were joking about how in this moment, this sucks. It's, there's, no, there's nothing like, oh yeah, like we're feeding the nature. Like, no, none of that. It sucked at that moment. But we were joking about how we're gonna look back at this fondly. We're gonna look back at these moments of <laughs> anguish and working through it because exactly that, because we worked through it. We and you were trying to convince yourself that that mattered at that moment? That, exactly. <laughs> so we like, Did it help at all? It, it, it does. It surprisingly, it does. Because it is one of those things where you realize that this is what pushing yourself actually means in that moment. You know, we have our own ideas of what pushing yourself to any sort of limit means. But once you are actually there, it's never comfortable. That's what idea of pushing your limit is. A lot, of, most of the time, it's doing something uncomfortable, something scary, something that you've never done before. And doing that in that moment became, you know, like that inside joke for us, like, oh man, we are not enjoying this at the moment, but we know that once we've done it, that will be something that you're proud of because you know that you did complete it. And for, for me, that's always an aspect where whatever bad thing you're going through in life, like, it is something that shapes you. Yeah. All the things that has happened in your life, good or bad, they made you who you are, if you want to or not. And you shouldn't shy away from that. Because in a world of only good, you will never, you don't even know what good is. You do need the bad to appreciate the good. 
and we're just going to leave it at that. That's a great way to end this. All right, well, thank you, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next week. Um, this is live from the Adventurers Club. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we will see you next week.